the Conference on World Drug Policy Directions after UNGASS 2016, and reviews on Thai drug laws and their interpretation at Centara Grand at Central Lat Prao on the 15th to the 16th of June 2016. Please give a big round of applause to Dr. Carl L. Hart. Dr. Hart is an Associate Professor of Psychology in both the Departments of Psychiatry and Psychology at Columbia University. He is known for his research in drug abuse and drug addiction. He studied the effects of drugs on the brain and human behavior for more than 20 years. His approach is the use of empirical evidence to guide public policy to have more humane and effective criminal justice policy and a healthier and more productive society overall. He received a Bachelor of Science in Psychology at the University of Maryland in 1991, a Master of Science in Psychology Neuroscience at the University of Wyoming in 1994, and a PhD in Psychology Neuroscience at the University of Wyoming in 1996. Apart from being a professor at Columbia University, Dr. Hart takes on a number of roles to promote effective drug policies and to educate people about drugs. For example, as the director of the Residential Studies and Methamphetamine Research Laboratories at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and member of a NIH review group. Dr. Hart has outstanding accomplishments. He received a number of awards, such as a Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Wyoming in 2015, and the Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award for High Price, a neuroscientist's journey of self-discovery that challenges everything you know about drugs and society in 2014. In addition to his scholarly work, Dr. Hart wrote several books and articles, such as Drug, Society and Human Behavior, and dozens of peer-reviewed scientific articles in the area of neuropsychopharmacology and several editorials in publications around the world, including the New York Times, US, and O Global, Brazil. Um, I must apologize for not speaking Thai, so please accept my apologies. Um, I am honored to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, Judge um, Gamja for inviting me, so thank you for having me here. Um, I would like to echo the remarks of the President of the Supreme Court. Um, when he tried to give a nice history lesson of what happened uh, related to drugs. Because if you know the history, you will understand what we're currently doing with drug policy is probably inappropriate. And I would like to further echo the remarks of the Minister of Justice when he said that we should make sure that our drug policy reflects science. We should make sure our drug policy is scientifically based. And today, what I'd like to do here is to help give a science lesson as it relates to methamphetamine. Now, I should, I should warn you, most science lessons are boring. <laughs> but I assure you, this science lesson will not be boring. You will have the most fun you've ever had in a science lecture. Okay? Are, are you with me? Now, before I start my science lesson, I must tell you where I came from. So this is me. This is me 25 years ago. Now, life has not been as kind, uh, but this is me 25 years ago. I started studying drugs because I wanted to solve the drug addiction problem. I was worried about drug addiction. 
and I was told that the problems faced by my community, I come from a resource poor community in the United States. I was told that the problems faced by my community were primarily because of drugs and drug addiction. So I reasoned that if I could cure drug addiction with science, I could cure or solve the problems in my community. So I studied neuroscience specifically to fix the drug addiction problem. Now, when I say I studied neuroscience, I want to explain what I mean. This is one of my first publications in 1996, 20 years ago. And this publication is entitled Nicotine's Effects on Dopamine Clearance, Clearance in the Rat Nucleus Accumbens. It's a region in the brain that we think is responsible for drug reward. Now, this is the brain, of course, and this area is called the ventral tegmental area, and it projects to the nucleus accumbens as well as the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex is important for us thinking and planning. The amygdala is important for our emotions. And the nucleus accumbens, we, th we think and thought then even more so, was critically important for drug reward. So my primary focus in science was to try to manipulate the neurotransmitters in this brain region in order to solve drug addiction. So I set out to do just that. And I published numerous papers based on the theory that if you can manipulate dopamine in the nucleus accumbens sufficiently, you can cure drug addiction. And so I published paper after paper. And in one paper, we saw some positive findings in 2004. We gave a drug called gabapentin. Gabapentin increases this neurotransmitter's activity called GABA. It inhibits other neurotransmitters. It inhibits dopamine. And we saw that when you give a drug like gabapentin, you can block the positive euphoria associated with cocaine. So we were encouraged. But we wanted to also block cocaine taking, cocaine self-administration. And so we increased the dose of gabapentin. Now, these research, this research is all done in people, people who are identified as crack cocaine addicts. So we increased the dose of gabapentin, and we tried to replicate the previous study. We didn't. We published several papers trying to replicate it. We did not impact or affect cocaine taking. We tried other drugs numerous other drugs based on this neurobiological theory. We were unsuccessful. We were hugely unsuccessful. So I had published dozens of papers based on this theory, but we were yet able to solve the problem of drug addiction. Now, despite my failure, at this point in my career, I was considering myself a failure because I did not do what I set out to do, and that's cure drug addiction. And I had failed. But despite my failure, I was really productive. I published a number of papers about my failure, and my failure was rewarded with multi-million dollar grants. My failure was rewarded with me being selected as a permanent member to, an act to the National Institute of Drug Abuses or National Institutes of Health grant review. So I was a permanent member as a result. My failure was also rewarded in that I was awarded tenure and also promoted to full professor. I was promoted to a professor. I'm a professor now. Even though I had all of those scientific failures, I did not do what I set out to do. But I was productive. 
And I was also selected to be a member of the National, Academy, the National Advisory Council on Drug Abuse. I served for three years as an advisor to the director of the U.S.'s National Institute on Drug Abuse, Nora Volkov. These were all the rewards of me failing to do what I set out to do. Some people thought productivity was success. I didn't. So it required me to step back, to reevaluate what I was doing, reevaluate what my field was doing. And in this reevaluation, I wrote a book. The book is called High Price. And in writing this book, I also got an education. I learned many lessons along the way as a result of having to write a book for the general public and not for the scientific community. And what I'd like to do here today is to share with you some of those lessons that I learned along the way. Those lessons will be critically important as you move forward in your thinking about methamphetamine and what to do about methamphetamine. So one of the first lessons that I learned, I learned that drugs themselves were not the problem. I thought crack cocaine in my case, I thought crack cocaine was destroying my community. I thought drugs were destroying my community. I thought drug addiction was destroying my community. I thought that everyone or the majority of the people who use crack cocaine were addicted because that's what the media said. That's what the judges were saying. That's what the people were saying. Even some people in science were saying it, but not many because the evidence said that the vast majority of people who use drugs, whether it's cocaine, crack cocaine, whether it's heroin, whether it's methamphetamine, whether it's alcohol or marijuana, the vast majority are not addicts. The vast majority of these people who take these drugs are actually responsible citizens. The vast majority of the people who take these drugs take care of their families. And in some case, they even become president of the United States. All three of these men used drugs when they were younger. Bill Clinton used marijuana. George Bush used marijuana, widely suspected of having used cocaine. Barack Obama, of course, used marijuana and cocaine. Now, the point here is not to tarnish these guys' reputations. That's not the point, because they can do that all by themselves. That's not why I'm here. The point here is this. The major point here is that these guys represent the rule. They are not the exception when it comes to drug users. The vast majority of drug users don't have a problem. Another major point is this, that if the vast majority of people, of users of a particular drug, no matter what that drug is, do not become addicted, then you cannot blame the drug for causing drug addiction. You cannot blame the drug. You have to look at other factors. That takes me to my next point. My next point, next lesson that I learned, is that attractive alternatives decrease drug use. Now, attractive alternatives are oftentimes unavailable to people in impoverished communities. Now, when I say attractive alternatives, I need to tell you some science that's related to this point so you understand that this is science, this is not my opinion. Let's start with rats, laboratory animals, rodents in the, in the laboratory. There is a guy called Bruce Alexander in Vancouver, Canada. He did a clever experiment in the 70s, and he published his first paper related to that experiment in 1978. Bruce thought that he would get animals to learn how to take in morphine, 
They could press a lever and receive morphine. So he thought it would be interesting to see whether or not the animals, if he enriched the cages of animals, some animals, versus not enriching the cages of other animals, he wanted to see whether there would be a difference in the amount of morphine that was taken in. What he found was that the animals who had enriched environments, enriched environments means things like sec other sex uh, sexually receptive mates, sweet treats, uh, toys, a wide range of alternatives in that environment. He found that the animals that had this enriched environment, they took far less morphine than the animals who had cages that only contained the animal. That was the first evidence. We thought it would be interesting to see if we could do this in humans. Because someone else did this in non-human primates. They found similar findings as Bruce Alexander's. And so we thought the next step would be to try this in humans. What we did was to bring cocaine addicts, identified as addicts by the DSM-4 or 5 now. We brought cocaine addicts into the lab, gave them a choice to take multiple hits of crack cocaine versus some small amount of money, like $5. When you give people an opportunity to take a drug, like crack cocaine, versus a monetary reward, like $5, what you find, something like crack cocaine, a hit of crack co cocaine that's worth more than $5, let me orient you to the slide. These are some of the data. These are the number of choices or selections for crack cocaine. And this, these are the number of selections for the $5. What you see is that they chose to take the drug on about the same number of occasions as they chose to take money. Now, if there was no alternative, they take drug on every opportunity. We thought it would be interesting to increase the amount of money and replicate these findings with another drug, like methamphetamine. And that's exactly what we did. In this experiment, we offered the methamphetamine users $20. And when you make, when you make the choice, a hit of methamphetamine or $20, they almost never take methamphetamine. They take the $20 on nearly every occasion. This is a powerful indication, a powerful demonstration that attractive alternatives decrease drug use. We have known this for some time, and these findings have been replicated in a variety of laboratories and also outside of the laboratory. Now, I want to make this clear, that when we think about drug addiction, I want to make sure everyone knows that Having limited attractive alternatives are not the only causes for drug addiction. That drug addiction can be caused uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that many people who are drug addicted uh, also have co-occurring co illnesses. Whether they are physical illnesses, people are in pain, or whether they are psychiatric illnesses, depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, a wide range of other uh, uh, psychiatric illnesses people may also have, and they may be treating those illnesses. That's, a, that's, that's another reason that people might become addicted. And also, when we think about the criteria, the symptoms that describe drug addiction, they are largely related to tempering one's behavior in some domain responsibility skills. There are a number of people in our society who simply have not learned appropriate responsibility skills and they can't temper their behaviors in multiple domains and drug use or drug taking just becomes another domain. And so that's a reason that some people meet criteria for addiction. And then there are, there are a host of other possible reasons 
I know one reason, uh, reason that's pretty popular is we think about biological reasons like genetics. It would be nice if there was some evidence to support the genetic sort of underpinning of addiction. But the genetics, the, the data to support the role of genetics is limited to, to almost none. But it's popular to point to genetics because genetics, in effect, has become the wastebasket of those things that we don't understand. So when we think about genetics, there are almost no data to support the notion that, drug addic there, that there are genetic bases for drug addiction. Now, I'm open to when those data become available, but I just simply have not seen much data that are impressive in that area. But the major point here is that people become addicted for a variety of reasons, and many of those reasons we can control if we simply put the work in and try to provide appropriate assessments to find out what's driving the addiction. But too often, what we do is we blame the drug. And that's inappropriate because the vast majority of people who use drugs don't have a drug addiction problem, so you cannot blame the drug. You have to look at these other factors. So another lesson that I've learned is that we, in science, have played a role in exaggerating the harmful effects of drugs. We have played a role in misinforming you, the public, about the effects of drugs. And that's one of the reasons that we are here today. That's, one, that's certainly one of the reasons that I traveled all the way to Bangkok to help correct some of the miseducation. Now, in the United States, we played a large role in exaggerating the harmful effects of methamphetamine. I want to show you a public service announcement that we released in the United States as it related to methamphetamine. We were educating the public, educating the public about methamphetamine. This is what we call education about methamphetamine. It takes about 20 seconds, so uh, please uh, check out this video. This isn't normal. But on meth, it is. So there are multiple points that they're trying to get across in this video. One of the more important points is that you can't try methamphetamine not even once or you'll become addicted. Uh, of course, that's wrong and inaccurate. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, another point that they're trying to educate about methamphetamine is that when people are using methamphetamine, they cannot respond appropriate to emergencies. That's, that's the second point. And the third point is that methamphetamine causes the user to have those types of seizures. I guess it's possible, but I just have never seen that before. And I personally, as part of my research, have given hundreds of doses of methamphetamine to people and carefully studied the effects. I just have not seen that ever before. So we look at this, at this type of pu public education, and we see that this public education is actually inconsistent with the scientific data. As I pointed out, part of my research, as part of my research, I bring people into the laboratory and give them drugs like methamphetamine and carefully study the effects of those people over time, sometimes more immediately. Now, this is, uh, this is a paper by, uh, a per, uh, by Matthew Kirkpatrick in, in my laboratory when he was doing, this is part of his PhD dissertation. Now, in this paper, this is just one simple example of methamphetamine acutely improving cognitive performance. That is, when you give the drug, it actually improves cognitive performance, as opposed to what that advertisement showed, that people cannot respond and they are cognitively impaired, such that they cannot re respond to, a, 
to emergencies. This is just a quick graph. I apologize for showing uh, graphs, but I just want to show you this quick graph. If you focus your attention on the black, that's placebo. Um, on the blue, that's 20 milligrams of methamphetamine. In the red, that's 40 milligrams of methamphetamine. And this is a simple task in which participants have to respond by pressing the space bar on their computer when they see three consecutive odd numbers or three consecutive even numbers. What you see on this task of sustained attention and vigilance is that methamphetamine here, the larger dose, 40 milligrams, actually improves the number of hits and decreases the number of misses. Performance is improved. In this study, as well as in all of these studies, when you give the drug acutely, when you give the drug and then you assess cognitive performance immediately after, you find that the drug actually improves cognitive performance. Now, when we think about methamphetamine, you also have to think about amphetamine. Now, I understand that amphetamines are banned in this country. I, I, I understand that. Everywhere except Thailand, people are using amphetamines. Students are using amphetamine in the United States uh, to um, study longer. Uh, people are prescribed amphetamine for attention deficit disorder, for narcolepsy. People are using amphetamine. And so we think of amphetamine as being okay, whereas methamphetamine, it's more toxic. And we think of methamphetamine being more toxic and more dangerous because of this red circle, this additional methyl group on methamphetamine. You see the two chemical structures. You focus your attention on the left, that's amphetamine. That's the chemical structure of, of amphetamine. On your right is the chemical structure of methamphetamine. The only difference is that red circle, that additional methyl group. It has been said that that additional methyl group causes methamphetamine to be more lipid soluble. That means that it crosses the blood-brain barrier more quickly. It gets in the brain more quickly. And that means that it's more dangerous, more potent, more addictive. That's what people have said. And so, as part of my studies, as part of my education, I went back and looked at the literature to actually see if there was any evidence to support this notion in people, in humans. And what I found was that there was a study done in 1971 where Billy Martin and his colleagues compared the effects of amphetamine and methamphetamine in people. And they studied heart rate, blood pressure, subjective effects ratings, euphoria. And what they found is that when you give the drug orally, up to 30 milligrams, which is a nice dose, you give the drug orally, the two drugs produce identical effects. They were the same drug. So we thought it would be interesting to increase the dose and give the drug via another route of administration. So we brought people into the lab, and we gave them doses up to 50 milligram via the intranasal dose. So they snorted the methamphetamine. And what we found was this. We found, we found that methamphetamine and amphetamine produce identical effects, even when you increase the dose and even when you give the drug intranasally. They are the same drug. Now, in the United States, when we think about methamphetamine, both of these drugs, amphetamine and methamphetamine, both of them are FDA approved. They are approved medicines. Physicians can write prescriptions for both of these drugs. For amphetamine, they can write prescriptions for attention deficit disorder as well as narcolepsy. And as was mentioned earlier by the president of the Supreme Court, Amphetamine is used globally by militaries around the world, except milita the military here, apparently. <laughs> that might tell you something if you want your military to be better. You might want to recommend amphetamine. But our military has used, in the U.S., 
have used amphetamine to help soldiers stay awake, fight longer, harder. We've used amphetamine since World War II. The Japanese, the Germans, on and on. They also use amphetamine for that purpose. And they continue to use amphetamine for that purpose to this day. We think of methamphetamine. Methamphetamine also is a, an improved medication in the United States. It's used to treat attention deficit disorder. It's also used to treat obesity. So it is not a surprise that these drugs produce similar effects. Now, I'm going to speed past that because I just said it. Now, we all now know what methamphetamine is. It's just a medication. It's just a drug. Now, we still have some concerns. We have some popular concerns. I have the, and I'd like to go through some of these concerns. I have popular concerns versus real concerns. I'm going to start with the popular concerns. The popular concerns are the ones that the public has that might be based on good information or it might just simply be based on anecdotal information. An anecdote, of course, are those great stories that we remember. Now, they might be representative of the larger sort of groups of, of what's actually happening, or they might be outliers. But the important thing about anecdote is that they are not empirical information. They are not empirical data. Anecdotes are simply stories. They can be made up, they can be fabricated, they can be miscommunicated. But they are not empirical information. An anecdote too often drives what we do in drug policy. And we're trying to change that. So when we're having conversations about drugs, there is a scientific literature that you can, you can go out, you can seek to find what's going on. Now when we think about some of the popular concerns, I talked a little bit about addiction previously in terms of all the drugs. When we think about methamphetamine specifically, all of the evidence show, the best evidence show, that less than 10% of the people who use methamphetamine will become addicted. That means that more than 90% of the people who use methamphetamine will not become addicted. And this is one of the citations, one of the better citations. But this isn't controversial or ground-shaking. We know this in the scientific literature. Another sort of popular concern is that methamphetamine causes brain damage and that this brain damage can lead to impairments including cognitive impairment and other types of behavioral impairments. This is another sort of popular concern. Certainly this concerns me. Now, one of the things that I think that we should understand when we're thinking about why there is this notion that methamphetamine causes brain damage. We should understand that this notion comes actually from scientific data. It comes from data collected in laboratory animals. This data shows that large doses of methamphetamine, when given to naive animals, you give them large doses, a large injection, you can see that the drug produces neurotoxic effects to monoamine-containing neurons. What do I mean when I say neurotoxic effects in monoamine neurons? It means that it can damage or destroy dopamine cells, norepinephrine cells, serotonin cells. These cells play a role in mood regulation. They play a role in cognitive performance. They play a role in movement. Large doses of methamphetamine given to naive animals can produce damage to those cells. And this damage can cause behavioral disruptions, including cognitive disruptions. Now, there is an important caveat to these data that is often overlooked or ignored. And that caveat is this. 
is that these toxic effects that I just described, damage to these, these uh, to dopamine cells, serotonin cells, norepinephrine cells, damage to those cells can be prevented when you give the drug in escalating doses, and then you give a large dose subsequently. So what it means is that when the animal becomes tolerant to the drug effects, it blocks this toxic effect, these toxic effects. Another thing that I didn't tell you, that in order to produce the toxic effects to these cells, you must give the animal doses that are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times doses that humans will take. So the doses have to be so large that humans don't take doses these large. So that's another important caveat. Now, that still leaves us with this question. Still leaves us with this question. Does methamphetamine cause brain damage and cognitive impairment in humans? That's the question that we ultimately con are concerned about. We are less concerned about whether the drug causes cognitive impairments or toxicity in rats when they're giving large doses. This is the question that we're concerned about. Now, before we answer this question, you must know one small important thing about good science when you're looking for impairments or damage. And that is, whenever you're comparing brain effects or cognitive functioning or performance in studies, you have to compare the performance the cognitive performance or even the brain structure size or activity, you have to compare those data with a normative database that is corrected for the participant's age and education level. What I mean is that if you're going to test cognitive performance of methamphetamine users, who do not have a college education. You have to compare their performance against a group, a normative group, who do not have a college education. Now, that's a larger normative, that many psychological tests have the normative data, so you can just simply compare the scores that you got with the methamphetamine users to this larger normative database. It's a simple thing to do. And many of the studies, what they simply do is they compare their drug users to a control group. And from that, they conclude, if the control group performs better on some measure, they conclude that the drug users are impaired. That's inappropriate. You must before you talk about impairment, you have to compare the scores to the normative database corrected for age and education. So what that means for us is that a statistical difference in a study does not equate to clinical or functional or practical significance. I hope that's clear. Because if you take nothing away from today's discussion, if you take away that point, you are smarter than most of the scientific community. That's an important point to take away from today's lecture. So statistical significance does not equate to functional or clinical significance. Let's go back to the original question. Does methamphetamine cause brain damage and cognitive impairments in humans? Now, I'm sure many of you all have seen brain imaging. The brain imaging that I have on the, on the slide here is what we call a PET image. In order to get this image, the researcher must inject into the body of the research participant a radioactive chemical. In this case, the radioactive chemical selectively binds to dopamine neurons. And when it binds to those neurons, it emits a signal. It lights up. Now, 
what this graph, what some researchers will tell you as an audience, because you don't know how the technique works, you don't know how this image was developed, what, what, what you will be told is that you should focus your attention on the left side of the graph. That's a person who has never used methamphetamine. If you focus your attention on the right side of the graph, that's a methamphetamine user, right? You guys got it? You can clearly see that the person on the left side has a brighter image. You will be told that this is indication of brain damage. That's inappropriate because these are not data. We can construct these images to be as bright as we want. The researcher controls this, and it varies from lab to lab, making it difficult to replicate in another lab. These are not data. These are data. These are data in the, in the open circles that those are data collected from people who never use methamphetamine. In the triangles, those are data from people who use methamphetamine. And these are brain regions uh, in the middle of the brain that contains dopamine. And this is a measure of dopamine binding. What we can see is that across this region, the methamphetamine users have lower binding potential. Now, this is an indirect measure of the availability of the cells, the dopamine cells in this region. An indirect measure, not a direct measure. Now, you can have different, you can have varying binding potentials for a variety of reasons. Not because the cells were destroyed or lost or damaged. Now, it's important for us to look at these data and see that many people in the methamphetamine group look like many of the people in the control group. There is a tremendous amount of overlap. That means, too, that if we image this side of the room compared to this side of the room, we can find differences. Because here we see about a 10 to 20 percent difference. That's a real difference. But what is the meaning of that difference? Is that difference within the normal human variability levels? There is a wide range of human variability in terms of brain imaging in humans. Is this within that level? Well, we don't know because there is not a standard. We only will know if there is a tremendous loss of dopamine cells or some other cell. But this does not constitute a tremendous loss. And we don't even know if this is a loss. We don't know what was there before methamphetamine use began. Now, these sort of de data troubled me. When I started to look at the literature, it troubled me. So it forced me to do a critical review of the entire literature related to methamphetamine and brain imaging and cognitive functioning. And that's what I did, and I published that paper in 2012. What I found when I did this entire literature review, what I found was that the cognitive functioning of methamphetamine users was normal within the average and the normal range when you had the appropriate controls. I also found that researchers in this field interpreted any brain difference between the methamphetamine users and non-users as something that was clinically significant and impaired, inappropriate. So when you look at the entire literature in terms of methamphetamine and cognitive functioning and brain imaging, you can see how we, as a science, have participated in the exaggeration of the negative or harmful effects of methamphetamine. This paper was published in Neuropsychopharmacology in 2012. 
I strongly suggest if you are interested in methamphetamine, you get this paper. Another popular concern deals with this issue of meth mouth, where you have tremendous tooth decay related to methamphetamine use. This was a popular concern in the United States. Now, as we think of meth mouth, it's important for us to know that methamphetamine restricts the salivary flow in the mouth and it leads to dry mouth. That's a fact. And when you have increased dry mouth, particularly chronically, that can lead or increase the likelihood of people getting plaques and tooth decay. That's true. It's also true that dry mouth is a relatively common side effect of many medications, particularly medica stimulant medications. Medi medications used to treat antidepressant, antidepression, or medications used to treat attention deficit disorder. There are methamphetamine restricts salivary flow about to the same extent of these other popular medications. But you don't hear people talking about those drugs causing extreme tooth decay. And then, when you look at the scientific literature to try and find evidence of methamphetamine actually causing tooth decay, there is virtually nothing in the scientific literature. There are many letters or case reports written to journals, but case reports oftentimes constitute little more than anecdotal report. There is virtually nothing in the literature showing mouth, mouth, meth mouth. So what this tells us is that, yeah, maybe people may have dental problems who use methamphetamine, but those problems have more to do with non-pharmacological factors than they do methamphetamine. And these non-pharmacological factors are things like poor hyg dental hygiene. And also, it's also related to media sensationalism. Now, <clears throat> as I think about the real concerns, when we think about the real concerns of methamphetamine or amphetamine, any stimulant drug, our real concerns is that we worry that these drugs do disrupt sleep. That's why they're taken. They're taken by the military in order to make sure soldiers don't fall asleep. So that means that if people are chronically using these drugs and not getting much sleep, that could be a problem. Because sleep is one of the most important basic biological functions to humans. If you don't get sleep chronically, in this increases the likelihood of psychiatric problems, other types of problems, physical problems. So these are real concerns. Another concern is that amphetamines are excellent appetite suppressants. That's why they are used in the treatment of obesity from time to time. So if people are taking amphetamines chronically and not eating well, they're not getting the nutrition that they need, that they need and they become more susceptible to physical illnesses and other types of illnesses. And so you want to make sure people are sleeping. You want to make sure people are eating. And if people are in poor cardiovascular health, amphetamines is a cardiovascular stressor. And it can exacerbate cardiovascular problems. So if people who are unhealthy, cardiovascularly speaking, are taking amphetamines, that's a real concern. But typically young people are not, do not have that problem. But these are real concerns. Now, it's clear that we have exaggerated the harmful effects of drugs. That's clear. Certainly with methamphetamine, it's clear. Now, when you make such a provocative statement, you have to at least provide the audience with some possible explanation of why we do this. And I'm going to do just that. I think we do this. Certainly in the US we do this. 
because it increases the budgets of those people who participate in the addiction industry. When I say addiction industry, I mean people like law enforcement, treatment providers, politicians. I even mean scientists, certainly the media. When we think about law enforcement, in the U.S., we spend $26 billion a year in this fight against drugs. It enhances the budgets of law enforcement, treatment providers. In the United States today, we think we have a heroin or an opioid problem. So much so that the president recently announced that he will put a billion new dollars into treatment for opioids. Treatment providers will benefit handsomely. We think about politicians. When you focus or exaggerate the harmful effects of drugs, you can say, I'm doing something about it. I'm putting more police on the street. I'm providing more money for treatment. That's not the problem when the vast majority of people who use these drugs don't need treatment. They don't need jail. So everybody pretends to be doing something for the problem when in fact they're not. The media, of course, these are great stories. They sell newspapers. They sell movies. And scientists, I built a career on negative findings in this area because the public was so concerned. I benefited. I'm here because of this. If this was not happening, you would not know who I am. So thank you. Now, I think Upton Sinclair said it best when he, when, when, he, when he tried to describe a similar situation. When he said that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not understanding it. That's the situation we have here. And it also allows us to avoid dealing with the real problems that are faced by poor people. We can say we're going after the drugs rather than saying that we need to create more jobs for them, rather than saying that we have to do a better job of educating them, rather than saying that we need to make sure that they have better nutrition and these other more difficult factors. This is another reason that we exaggerate the harmful effects of drugs. And finally, it allows us to target people who we don't like without explicitly saying we're targeting them. We don't have to say we don't like those poor people. We don't like those black people. We can simply say we're going after methamphetamine. We're going after crack cocaine, and that's okay. And that's what we do. Now, I want to give you an example from the United States before I wrap it up, and then I'll wrap it up here shortly. I want to give you an example uh, in the United States as it relates to crack cocaine. I got in this business because I thought crack cocaine was destroying my community. This is a picture on the, on the slide. If you focus your attention on the left, that's a picture of powder cocaine. You focus your attention on the right, that's a, pet, a picture of crack cocaine. Go back to the left and look at the red circle. That red circle is called the hydrochloride group. That's the only difference between these two drugs. That hydrochloride group does not participate in the pharmacological effects of these drugs. It's only there to keep the compound stable, such that you cannot smoke the compound. If you want to smoke it, you have to remove the hydrochloride portion. Some people figured out that if you dissolve powder cocaine in water and baking soda, and you heat it up, and you dry it out, the hydrochloride portion is no longer there, and you can smoke it. Some people figured that out. Now. Other than the hydrochloride portion, which does not contribute to the pharmacological effects of the drug, they are the same drug. It's true that when you smoke crack cocaine, the effects are more intense and more rapid, uh, the, the onset of the effects are more rapid than when you snort powder cocaine. That's true. But when you dissolve powder cocaine in water and you shoot it intravenously, it produces the same intensity of effects and the same rapid onset of effects as smoking crack cocaine. They are the same drug. They are the same drug. Keep that in mind as we move, go back 30 years or so to 1986 in the United States when we thought that crack cocaine was the biggest problem that our country faced. 
like you now think that methamphetamine is a big problem that your country faced. We thought this in 1986 about crack cocaine. We thought crack cocaine was so dangerous and so bad that we punished crack cocaine violations more severely than any other drug, and we punished crack cocaine violations a hundred times more severely than powder cocaine violations, even though, remember, they are the same drug. Now, our punishments were so severe that people caught with small amounts of crack cocaine were required to go to jail for a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. To trigger the same sentence for powder cocaine, you had to have 100 times more powder cocaine. What happened in the intervening years is that we discovered that 80% of the people that we were arresting, more than 80% of the people that we were arresting for these drugs were black and poor, even though black people did not make up the majority of these users. We discovered this in the early 1990s. And then in the mid-1990s, we asked President Bill Clinton to change the law. In fact, the judges, the Sentencing Commission in the U.S., the judges who determined what the infraction for law, law violations should be, they recommended that we change the law to equate powder cocaine with crack cocaine. Bill Clinton, along with Congress, rejected that recommendation. For the first time in the U.S. Sentencing Commission's history, their recommendation was rejected. And Bill Clinton said that we have to send a constant message to our children that drugs are illegal, drugs are dangerous, drugs may cost you your life, and the penalty for dealing the drugs are severe. This is what Bill Clinton said. Even though we saw this racial discrimination and, and even though we learned that the drugs were the same. Fast forward 12 years later. Presidential candidate Barack Obama comes along and he was upset about the policy. He thought the policy was inappropriate. He was right when he said, he said that judges think that's wrong, the policy. Republicans think that's wrong. Democrats think that's wrong. And yet it's been approved by Republicans and Democratic presidents because no one has been willing to brave the politics and make it right. That will end when I'm president. The question before us today, did it end? That's a question to you. Did it end? Well, kind of. It didn't completely end, but President Obama signed legislation that decreased the disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Remember, I said the drugs are the same. There should not be a disparity. And I think Malcolm X speaks to this issue best posthumously. Of course, he's dead. But he once said that if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there is no progress. And that's basically what has happened. And this is important. This is important because even to this day, 80% or more people convicted under this law are black. Even to this day, we still see this injustice happening. This still happens. And this and other types of drug-related injustices in the United States have led to some horrifying statistics. As you all know, we lead the world in incarceration. We have 2.2 million people in prison in the United States, in large part because of our enforcement of drug laws. Other statistics, statistics. blacks represent about one-third of all drug arrests, even though they use drugs at similar rates as their uh, uh, white counterparts. One in, one in three, one in three black boys can, to, born today can expect to spend some time in prison if we continue on the same path. One in three. And when we think about the general population in the United States, black men make up 6% of the entire population, but they make up nearly 40% of the prison population. These are some of the horrifying statistics that we have as a result of inappropriate drug laws. Now, as I think about the Thai situation, you are trying to be like us. That's not good. You are the sixth largest. You have the sixth largest prison population in the world. 
And the vast majority of those people in your prison, of course, are poor. And they are there because of drug law violations. And then when you look at the situation with women, it's even more horrifying. You have the highest rate of females incarcerated in the world. That is not to be proud of. More than 80% of the women incarcerated in your jails are there because of the methamphetamine law violation. This is embarrassing, particularly when you know about the real effects of methamphetamine. They are not as what they are often portrayed. When you look at the science, something's very wrong here. Very wrong. Now, I'm going to conclude by saying some of the things that we can do as a society, what you can do. One of the things that we can do is that we can, if we are really concerned about our societies, the first thing that we can do is make sure that people's basic needs are met. Make sure that people have housing, meaningful employment, education, appropriate education. If people's basic needs are met, they're more likely to contribute to your society. It's not that complicated. Another thing that we can do is that we can call out discrimination when we see that the vast majority of people in our prisons, the vast majority of the people who are affected by these inappropriate laws are poor people, people we don't like. We should be courageous and call this out publicly. We should call out the people who are supporting these policies. And we should also look at ourselves to make sure that we're not doing this. And we can also work to change the legal status of our drugs. Whether we think about decriminalization of all drugs like they have done in Portugal, like they've done in the Czech Republic. They have done this now for nearly 20 years in those countries, and they have been successful. Or whether you think about legalization like we have done in some of our states, uh, four states, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska with marijuana. No matter what you decide, you can think about what's more appropriate for this society. And as you make changes to your drug policy, you have to constantly evaluate the risk-benefit ratio. That is, are you having more negative effects based on the policy than you are positive effects? If you're having more negative effects, then you may have to tweak it and change it. You have failed to do that with the current policy. So you, it's incumbent upon responsible people in society to be cognitively flexible such that you constantly evaluate this risk-benefit ratio. If you are not doing that, you are less than responsible. You are less than responsible citizens. And we must change the narrative of how we see what we consider drug users. Too often, we think of drug users are those people who are drug addicted. There are a small percentage of people who are drug addicted. But they represent a minority. They are not the rule. They are the exception. And they have problems that are way beyond drugs in many cases. And so we can't blame drugs. We should help them, of course. But that's not the drug user. That's someone who has problems. And their, their problems may or may not be related to drugs. And finally, you must... Put the work in. You must do the work. There's no shortcuts. You must read. You must know the scientific literature. You can't just accept what people say, including me. You have to be exceptional and read and do the work because people in your society who don't have a voice depend on you doing that. If you don't do that, you have failed them. And you have to participate in correcting this misinformation. We see it with methamphetamine. Please read the literature. Read the literature that you will be given here today. It is clear. And I, should, I will leave you with this final note. What I have laid out here today is not a formula for popularity. This is a difficult task, and it's a lonely task. 
but it's the just task, and it's the right task. But you will find that you will be lonely because it's so much easier to vilify people as well as drugs than to stand up for them. I will leave you on that note, and thank you for your time. They have got a back plane, so can I sit? Uh, can I stand? Oh, I hope that methamphetamine can kill my pain. <laughs> so I asked you some questions. Can I, can I walk in? I would like to ask you the first question. It's about that. Uh, when you say that uh, in your country, uh, under the drug laws, do the law punish user of methamphetamines? Punish? crime punishment by user of methamphetamine. Still punished? Yes. Only user. Users uh, and traffickers are punished. No, just user. Just con uh, I'm sorry? Or inhale the methamphetamine. And that's all. No other crime punishment. Are you still uh, you have to consume, consume the drug, the methamphetamine? I, I don't understand the question. You're asking if uh, people who consume methamphetamine are yeah. punished. Yes, yes yeah. they are. Yes. Um, prison? Prison yes. term? Yes. Okay, so then um, the next question is that uh, you said that uh, the cognitive function is not impaired on the meth user, right? It's not impaired. It's not, okay. Yeah. I got a, a case. It's about the, um, the drug user who commit crime on the possessing the drug, the methamphetamine. And he tried to, he uh, confessed of his wrongdoer by using the, his uh, medical, uh, medical, um, what you call, medical background mm -hmm. to claim that he is using the drug by the time he commit crime. Mm -hmm. So uh, the court should not punish him because under, he's doing under the influence of the drugs. I, I will give you the, uh, the, the uh, medical background, put it on the video. medical background. Okay. This is the medical report that she gave us, she gave to me. She yeah. said that she used it. No, 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 not this one. Uh, okay. This is the doctor who gave me the report of her medical background. The point is that uh, finally, she used the drug for 20 to 10 years and four months and took the 30 tablet of amphetamine every day. And finally, the doctor said that she is a psychotic disorder. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if the amphetamine is not damaged brain, so this report should be false, right? Um, please recall in the lecture when I said that anecdote is not evidence, right? This basically amounts to anecdote, and I'll tell you uh, why. This is just doesn't make any sense, that's what I mean. Uh, the notion that she was using almost 30 tablets a day, uh -huh. something's very wrong with that. I don't know what milligrams were in the tablets, but that's a difficult thing for me to believe. Uh -huh. If she's using 30 tablets a day, that should have triggered in the doctor that something's wrong with that report. Something's going on. And if anybody is using 30 tablets of anything a day, you have before you somebody who's sick other than drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, drugs might be a, may play a role, but there are bigger problems in this case than drugs. And, and to focus on drugs, would be irresponsible. So I, I cannot rely on this report, right? No, this is irresponsible. 
Uh, if somebody is taking 30 tablets a day, it seems like we should really be looking at her psychiatric history, other things in her environment. There's a wide range of things that we should be looking at, but methamphetamine would be low on the list that we're looking at. Okay, so another question. I read on your paper, you said that uh, low to moderate doses of amphetamine can improve mood, right? Mm -hmm. Enhance performance and delay the need for sleep. Mm -hmm. Repeated administration of large doses of the drug can severely disrupt sleep and lead to psychological disturbance, mm -hmm. include paranoia. Mm -hmm. So this report should be correct, right? Uh, I said in my talk today that the real concerns are the sleep disruptions, okay. so that's a fact. Uh -huh. And because those sleep disruptions could cause psychiatric problems, mm -hmm. physical problems, yes. That's a, that's a concern. But when she says that, or whoever this person is, that there are 30 tablets taken a day, something's very wrong with this person. Okay. Amphetamines, of course, I don't want people taking large doses of amphetamine chronically. I don't want anyone to do that. Uh -huh. But what I'm saying is that this physician is failing this patient by only focusing on methamphetamine. Okay. My last question. Okay, my last question is that uh, this is uh, the drug Thai laws. They classify the, um, what do you call, amphetamine into the first the yes. category one, which is the drug, uh, the hard drug, right? Yes, yes. Do you think it's uh, reasonable to do that? Um, I mean, if, if we don't want to reclassify it, yes. uh, just put it this way. No, I don't think it's reasonable. Um, in fact, we in the United States don't think it's reasonable. That's why we categorize it as a legal drug to be used in medicine. And so, of course, I don't think this is reasonable. Okay, if we are going to reveal the drug law, yes. but don't touch this, we still put it into the same category one. Yes. Do you think this, uh, this legal structure should be okay, should be reasonable. What legal structure, I'm sorry? I mean, how to punish the amphetamine with the same category of heroin, um, uh, LSD? Uh, what I know about your drug laws now is that I think 375 milligrams uh -huh. of methamphetamine mm -hmm. is punished with, is it four, four to, four. four to how many years? 15 years? 15 years. Four to 15 years and it will require 10 times as much heroin to trigger the same penalty. Uh -huh. Three grams, I believe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's inappropriate. That is clearly inappropriate. Okay, thank you, Professor. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Next, next question, please. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Bunjaket uh, Pumtip, working at the uh, Court of Appeal. Yes, as you just said, that uh, we have spent a lot of, of money on drug prohibition policy. We put a lot of people in jail, but it seems that we losing war on drug. Yeah, my question is that based on the uh, scientific approach, you think that should we legalize drugs? As you know, the uh, some states in the U.S. just. Uh, namely, again, Colorado, Washington, uh, Washington D.C., uh, what else? Alaska, Alaska, and Wy not Wyoming, no, uh, Oregon. 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 Yes. Yes. Just, just make the uh, marijuana yes. legal for uh, recreation. Yes. What is your opinion? What do you think? Uh, what is my opinion in the United States or no, my no, opinion about a, Thai? All over the whole world. Uh, <laughs> all over the world. Yes. yes. What do you think? I, I immediately before I, before I came here, I was in London, and immediately before that, I was in France. And I've done a lot of work in South America, and I've been in the Philippines, a wide range of places. And when I think about drug policy and what it should be, it's really dependent upon the local community. Like as I think about the Thai situation, there is so much propaganda and misinformation about drugs that you are not ready for legalization in this country. We must first, first we have to scale back those punitive laws, of course, 
But then we need a massive re-education of people about drug laws. I mean, about, about the effects of drugs, about what drugs actually do. And then as we begin and complete this education, we can think better about what's more appropriate for this society. But frankly, um, I, would, might, I might be horrified what would happen as if, if you legalize drugs. Not so much because of the drugs, but what the drugs will be blamed for. And then the subsequent action of the state or the government on those people who are, who are involved with drugs. And so uh, we need to do the re-education first and then have uh, this corresponding uh, uh, change in how we go about it. So that means that we might consider de decriminalization. We may just make sure that people are not going to jail for these drugs, but they still remain illegal. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon, Professor. If I recall the two questions I asked you, I said, blame it on. But actually, I do not think that amphetamine was the reason. It might be the problem of sleep deprivation, poly drug use, self-medication because of some others, but uh, people have a tendency just to measure one thing uh, and, and do not measure the others. So. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that um, people do not misunderstood that it's the reason. Actually, it's just, just, just the blame. The, the, the real question is about the treatment. Because now, the government and many people would like uh, that we will emphasize on public health and health issues. They are going to send hundreds of thousands of people for the treatment without necessary. Because you say that less than 10% of uh, the people consume uh, these kind of things will need treatment. So uh, I would like you to emphasize that don't push too many people for drug treatment and rehabilitation which they do not want. Thank you. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. That's the concern. One of the things that has happened around the world is that it has become fashionable to say, we don't need to imprison our people, we need to send them to treatment. So we rather them go to treatment than jail, as if those are the only two choices. Those are false choices. And it's easier to say, we're going to send them to treatment because you appear to be compassionate. But what that really is, is ignorance par parading or masquerading as compassion. That's not appropriate either. And so I try to emphasize that by saying that the vast majority of drug users don't need treatment, nor do they need jail. That's why places like Portugal allow people to use, to uh, have drugs, uh, it's decriminalized such that it, their policy recognizes that it's more than treatment or jail. Of course, if people need treatment, we like to make sure it's available to them. But that's a small minority.